Um, thank you everybody for joining us on this live discussion. My name is Steve Warner. I'm the interviewer, facilitator, perhaps peacekeeper for this episode, which is entitled Chargeback Processes, What Issuers and Acquirers Need to Know. This is episode number four in a new series by FI911, where we interview thought leaders in payments, fintech and business. This and future conversations will be published on YouTube and as audio podcast episodes. For those of you unfamiliar with FI911, we are the newly formed sister company of Chargebacks 911. We offer a variety of solutions and revenue opportunities for financial institutions and payment service providers, including our Dispute Lab service, which is a fully integrated dispute management platform for acquirers. Episodes will be published on the Chargebacks 911 YouTube channel and as an episode on the Chargebacks audio podcast by searching Charge Forward, which is all one word. So look, without any further ado, let me introduce you to our guests because these are the most important people on this, uh, on this session. Um, first of all, we have a renowned expert, Chargeback expert, Isabel Onkelinks, who's a founder of IO Resolution. We also have Tracy Cray, Director of Card Scheme Compliance at FI911, and Craig McClure, who is the Director of Relationship Management for FI911. So before I start interrogating you, it's only fair that I give you guys opportunity to prove to everybody that's watching and listening on this um, session what your credentials are around chargebacks and issuing and acquiring. Um, so here's some 15 or rather 15 seconds of fame, perhaps. Isabella, if I can start with you, if you could give us a little bit about your background, that'd be great. Uh, thanks, Steve. So I'm Isabel Onkelings, and I am a freelance chargeback consultant. I provide chargeback advice and training to issuers, acquirers, processors, and merchants. Um, some of you may remember me from my MasterCard days where I worked for 28 years. Uh, so in all, I have about 30 years of chargeback and dispute resolution experience. And at MasterCard, I was arbitrating on cases, on chargeback cases, compliance cases, providing um, chargeback advice and training uh, extensively to all MasterCard customers. You've certainly passed the... Uh... The expert, you have a tick in the box. Thank you, Isabel. Um, over to Tracy. Tracy, first of all, happy birthday to you. Um, I'm sorry you've had to um, shorten your birthday celebrations, but happy birthday. Welcome to the call. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, about your background, please? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Steve. So thank you for my birthday wishes. You owe me one large bottle of wine for coming on to do this. <laughs> so my background, I spent um, 35 years um, with one of the big um, UK banks um, heading up the chargeback, um, fraud chargeback and dispute department and the consumer law. Um, I, during that time, I chaired the European Experts Chargebacks Working Group. I came across to FI911 probably about four and a half years ago, um, bringing with me um, a team of absolute a wealth of experience. Um, so I'm extremely proud of, of the team we've actually pulled together now for FI911. Um, and during that time, I've actually set up the UK Experts Chargeback and Compliance Group, which is a, a great group for issuers and, and acquirers to actually come together um, and share the pains and experiences um, in terms of the, the chargeback world, bearing in mind that chargebacks aren't competitive as such. We're all working to the same rules. So it's nice that everyone can come together and have those discussions. Thanks, Tracy. I'm not sure it's not competitive, I have to say, but we'll, we'll find out a little bit, a bit more about that shortly. Um, Craig, um, I don't think you've been on the planet 35 years. Um, please tell us a little bit about your background. Steve, that's very kind, but not true. Um, but not, not by much, though. Um, so, well, you're loyal, you're loyal listeners, Steve. I, I've um, been on one of your episodes before, so, um, you know, I shouldn't need no introduction, but... Um, for those who may be joining joining you late or listening in reverse order, um, I'm Craig. I work alongside Tracy at FI911. I've been here for for three three years. Before that, I was um, three years with Visa uh, in London, and then before that, 15 years 
um, across two of the, the large retail banks in the UK, doing mo mostly issuing roles, product, risk, fraud, chargeback operations, um, and also a little bit of acquiring work as well. So a drop in the ocean compared to the, to the, the combined experience of Tracy and Isabel, perhaps, but um, I'll try. <laughs> Thanks, Craig, that's great. Um, well, by the sounds of it, this session will be easy, having uh, you three uh, talking about a subject that you clearly know an awful lot about. So let me start then. I just want to set the scene for everybody that's, that's listening. Um, at a really high level, I want to start by asking, from a financial institution's point of view, and this could be issuing or acquiring, what role does the uh, chargeback processes and rules actually play in the payments ecosystem? Are they important? Would the system still work without them? How relevant are they to, to issuers and acquirers? I'd be grateful for your, for your views on this. Um, Isabel, can I start with you, please, on this one? Yes. Um, so uh, I often say that the chargeback system uh, that was invented many, many years ago is, is absolutely brilliant uh, because it, it really makes sure that there's a, a process in place to, to prevent rogue behavior um, as much on the merchant side or the issuer side or, or the acquirer side. Um, it's a balanced system put in place by the schemes because basically what I, what I often say as well is that every chargeback could potentially be prevented in an ideal world. Uh, of course, we don't live in an ideal world, and so reality is that things do go wrong. Um, transactions are processed more than once. Cardholders don't receive merchandise that they ordered. Uh, they often, well, sometimes they'll get charged uh, in a currency that they haven't agreed to. And the chargeback process ensures that when something does go wrong, the issuer has the right to recover funds for the cardholder on behalf of the cardholder. And if the issuer doesn't follow the rules and doesn't process the chargeback correctly or, or tries to play the system, well, there's the second presentment that's there in, in order to rectify any invalid chargeback. And if either of the two parties cannot agree or aren't sure which one is right, which one's not, uh, well, didn't make the right decision, well, ultimately the schemes are there to arbitrate and make sure that everyone follows the rules. Okay, so as far as you're concerned, a fundamental part of the payments ecosystem is it's oiling the machine, if you like, and also giving cardholders confidence in the process. Tracy and Craig, do you, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yes, I think, Steve, you're quite right. Something you just said there, it's the confidence that a customer has. Um, they like to know in terms of when they are using their cards that if anything goes wrong they have got the confidence there that they potentially can get their money back that also has a sometimes a detrimental side of things in that the card holder is too quick to go to the bank or their issuer to actually try and get their money back rather than trying to sort something with the merchant um, but as Isabel said, where we, there is the representment stage there in, in both the MasterCard and Visa rules um, and the other schemes as well, it does mean that luckily the merchant does have the chance to actually come back with evidence, um, maybe to prove that the, the cardholder was actually incorrect. A lot of the time the cardholder is, is too quick to just jump and, and want their money back and not prepared to try and come up with some resolution. Well, that's from somebody who's been in issuing for a long, long time. So that's that's good to uh, that's good to hear. That that sort of balance view. Um, I've Craig, any very bad cardholder behaviour. I used to track it. It does happen, unfortunately. Oh, I'll, I'll, um, that's interesting. I'll ask you for a, for a couple of examples of that later, if that's all right. Um, Craig, anything you'd like to add? I think I would agree with Isabel and Tracy. I, I mean. You know, just like a, a Big Mac, if you order it in London, it should look exactly the same as the one you ordered in Hong Kong, New York, LA, wherever. Card payments are the same. Customers expect them to work exactly the same way wherever they use the card. So underpinning that is is a set of rules that, that mean that if you transact on the other side of the world or on the internet with a merchant on the other side of the world, however you do that, the, the, the protection and the rules and the guarantee that comes with using the card is the same. And the chargeback rules underpin all of that. So... Um, you know, understanding those and, and being fully versed in them for any issuer and, and acquirer is, is is absolutely fundamental to how you run the business. That's really, really important. The unsung hero of card payments, in fact, are the chargebacks, I always think. 
Wow, the unsung hero. Yeah, That's yeah. a lovely thing. Okay, well, we'll, we'll see how, um, how much of a hero they are in a second, I guess. Right, I want to get down to a specific question here now. I mean, I've noticed an incredible growth in uh, the number of card issuers globally um, over recent years. Everybody seems to um, want to have a slice of this. But when I think about an issuer, I think they must be spending all of their time, new issuers I'm thinking of here, spending all of their time trying to different, differentiate their proposition, choosing the right brand, getting the pricing right, getting the go-to-market correct, and then onboarding needs to be slick, and they need effective credit control. How important really is chargeback management? Can, can chargeback and dispute handling be, be left for phase two, phase three? Or do, do new issues to the market really need to consider dispute management in the same way that they do those other, other areas that I talked about. Isabel, if I can start with you, what, what's your thoughts on this? Right, well, I agree. I think that um, although I don't like to look at negative things uh, to begin with, but I think that issuers definitely have to plan for the worst. And so they have to realize that, that chargebacks are a reality. And one of the first things I'd like to point out is um, putting in place robust authorization parameters, and in particular, stand-in parameters. I still remember all those cases where a new issuer who just started testing their cards and just opened their systems would get bombarded with fraudulent transactions from fraudsters who would try to um, saturate the authorization system and therefore reroute those authorizations to stand-in which would get authorized because they hadn't set up their authorization parameters properly. And then these issuers would come to me and ask me, well, how do I charge them back? And I would just be able to say, well, you, you can't because they were authorized. You gave uh, the scheme the authorization parameters and therefore you, you can't charge them back. So authorization is key. It's very important to make sure that the systems are, are up and running um, properly. And I'd also like to point out how important training is. From the beginning, the people working the chargebacks need to have the appropriate training to know what they're doing. Yeah, I think Isabel, I mean, the training is such a key feature. I think a lot of the time, certainly when I've seen issuers actually, when they're looking to first come into the market, they almost see chargebacks as something that will happen later on down the line. And I don't have to worry about it at the moment. Um, and then, like you say, they get hit with a, a huge amount of, of fraud or even their customers when they're actually using their cars and they start getting these chargebacks come through. And if they haven't actually invested in the training way before they've even launched, um, this is where I see a lot of the issuers really struggling. And then they make very bad decisions on their first chargebacks that they're choosing. So they end up with, with a write off. Um, a lot of the time, they almost think that chargebacks won't impact them, that they've done so much homework that they, they're not going to have any issues, when in reality, you will always have some sort of dispute when a cardholder is interacting with a merchant, whether it's a case of the goods haven't been received or they're not happy with the goods or the goods they got are faulty, just because you've got a brand new, lovely, shiny issuer card, that's not going to stop a dispute happening. I think, Tracy, that's, it. that's exactly what I was going to say, I think, about service, because new entrants to the market, Steve, to your point, probably spend a lot of time thinking about the app, the card design, is it going to be embossed or is it going to be metal? So all the, all the sexy stuff. All these lovely things, right? Yeah. But but actually, when it comes to the customer needing help with the transaction, they're, they're at the mercy of the issuer. So if you've overlooked chargebacks and how you've constructed the operation or the customer service or the training, then you'll have a real problem and, and that will become a reputational issue. So any, any small issuer or any new issuer who doesn't consider how they're going to deal with customers in distress or at a moment of truth, um, however you want to describe it, whenever they've got a problem with the transaction will, will be, um, I don't want to say doomed to failure, but certainly it's going down the wrong path, I think. Okay. That's, that's it's right. I think as well that, that they often forget in terms of vulnerable customers um, I expect a bit later on we'll, we'll talk about the different scams that, that go on, but new issuers don't tend to give that sort of amount of focus. They, they, they want to have, like you say, a real sexy way of a customer being able to contact them, whether it's via the app or um, online. Um, 
but they need to consider that there are vulnerable customers out there that potentially need a lot more hand-holding um, and it's not it's not good enough for them just to go and click a few buttons. They need proper conversations to get to the bottom of what's actually happening to them. Yeah. Um, can I just ask, um, and, and really to guide any issuers that are listening now, the training you're talking about, where can they get this from? Is it something that the schemes offer or is it something that issuers need to develop in-house? What, what's the best way for them to, to, to address that? Well, of course, the schemes do provide training. Um, so the, the large schemes, MasterCard, uh, Visa provide training. Um, I, I provide training as a freelance consultant. Um, Sorry, Tracy. Isabella didn't catch that. Just say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> No, I think, Isabel, what we were trying to say is the schemes obviously do the uh, training. Um, you obviously are renowned for your training that you used to do in your previous role. Um, and you've carried that on and you're now doing it independently. And, you know, to be fair, you trained me, Isabel, years and years ago. So uh, you've got absolute every reason to shout your credentials out of you provide training. Um, but then right. on the other part of things, obviously, um, my team do as well. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much I can, you know, honk my horn here. So, um, and I'm not used to doing that. So it's not easy for me. That's fine, Isabel. We'll honk it for you. Okay. <laughs> I, was to, I was trying to give the opportunity to uh, promote yourself, Isabel, but that's fine. I think you've got the, the, key, the key points over. So for, for an issue, what I'm seeing is once there is some opportunity from the schemes to get some training, they probably need to look outside as well to experts that have been involved in the industry for a long time, but have, that have recognized there's a gap in training and there are companies around to help there. So that, that's great. Um, I think one of the things, Steve, is of course that classroom training is very different to on the floor when you've actually got a card holder on the phone with you. Um, so what you learn in a classroom sometimes is quite hard to actually bring back into the office environment. So it's really ensuring that you've got the right tools to help those operators right up front. Um, we could talk about scripting, for example, when you've got a, a huge customer services uh, team answering calls, but they may be taking calls about a change of address, about a new PIN, they need a new card. They might only actually get two calls a day out of 300 that is disputulated. Yeah. Uh, so it's ensuring that when they do get that call, they are really well versed in how to handle um, because they could end up saying that they will take the dispute on and then when it gets to the back office there is no chargeback right so yeah. you need to be able to set the customer's expectation right up front and i think that's something that a lot of issuers need to invest more in um, ensuring that that first point of contact with the cardholder gets the right answers and reasons for why the, the cardholder is so distressed at that point in time yeah okay that's they're great points. And we talked about scripting there. Should issuers be developing online type questionnaires or is this scripting tracer you're talking about, which is for call handling? What, 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 what's your experience on that? So my experience, I would like to say, always talk to the custom, the cardholder. Um, you get much more information by actually having that quality conversation with them. A lot of the online questionnaires that I've seen that, that um, issuers have developed, they almost try and push the cardholder down a certain route to almost anticipate what they believe the cardholder is saying and have a, a strong chargeback rule that they can use. Whereas actually, if they'd had that quality conversation, they would have realised that they've totally chosen the wrong chargeback rule and end up losing um, and having to take it as a loss, as a write-off in, in, in the bank's books. I, I've had loads of conversations both in the bank and out of the bank when I've not worked in a bank about the importance of the conversation and, and or can we digitise it? Can we push it online? Can we make it really easy? And that, that's great. So you save a lot of money probably on telephony and case ingestion. But what you will find is that when you've been doing that for a few months, you find the cost ends up in the back office because the quality of the chargeback, well, either you're writing off more transactions than you should, 
or the quality of the chargebacks is is um, is poorer, and you end up with costs of having to deal with um, when Isabel was talking about the second presentment, when the merchant comes back to say, look, this isn't right, I've got more evidence. So talking to the customer up front gets all the information, gets the full story, gives you a, a better chance to mold the case um, and is worth doing because you will you will end up paying paying more later for having not done that, I think. Yeah, good, good points. And just picking up on what, what you guys were saying, I think my experience is when I, if I have a, a query with my card, I get, go to a call center. If, that, if I then have a query with a transaction, I'll probably go to the same call center. Is there a strategy here around setting up a separate team to handle cardholder disputes? From your experience, is that a good methodology to have or do you feel disputes can be handled in a general call center environment? I mean, that's something that I feel very passionate about. So in my previous role, um, I realized that too many mistakes were being made with the calls going into the mass call center. So I actually set up a dedicated team that was just handling any uh, disputes and, and fraud related queries as well. Um, I believe that is the right way, although it's very difficult for some of the banks when you've got limited number of, of FTE handling the calls. Mm -hmm. So if you can't ring fence, then back to um, Isabel's point, just train those staff and help them and give them the tools to actually have the correct conversation with the cardholder when they first come in. So if you can't ring fence, then give the right tools to the operators that are having to handle those calls, but they may only get sort of two or three a day um and let them really understand what they should be i want to almost say interrogating but that sounds a bit harsh really good uh, word but a, a lot of the time the, the card holder is panicking and quite often they will say i didn't authorize this transaction it wasn't me i don't recognize it um which is very quick to say not a problem we we'll take that for you and you'll get a refund immediately obviously because of the rules under the payment services directive um when actually if they had more of a conversation and it does take a bit longer in terms of the average handling time which i know a lot of the operators are targeted on but a little bit more time there you'd probably find they did authorize that transaction but something's gone wrong with it and they're just panicking and wanting their money back and believe it's easier to say, that wasn't me. Yeah, yeah. Right, and I think that's really important what you just said, Tracy, because I think that the fact that you have to challenge the cardholder and, and that takes time, that takes uh, understanding of, of the disputes. Um, this is a, a recurring transaction. Are you sure you didn't participate in a recurring transaction? Did you cancel? And to have the proper information, having the authorization and clearing data up front in order to be able to identify a certain type of transaction in order to ask the right questions. I think I think that's the that's the main thrust of this, right? So it's it's being it's enabling your people, and a form can't do this, to politely challenge the customer on what they're telling you. And that's a, that's as much about training because you need to know. Like to, as well, you just said, like the, the 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 content of the authorization and clearing, so you know where the card was, what, what the mode of entry was, what the type of security was, what the customer's IP address was at the time, what the device was they used. Is it the same device they used for internet banking on your app? You know, having all that data available to the agent to build up a picture, to be able to say to the customer, well, I don't think what you're telling me is necessarily true here, but doing that in a polite enough way that you get a good outcome. So it's a skill. It needs investment uh, and it needs needs. Um, it's, uh, it needs constant feeding. You have to keep that skill refreshed. You can't just do it once and, and then go off into the sunset with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. Just, yeah, just link well, to that. Steve. Sorry, Steve. The other thing there is that actually monitor the cardholders too, because once a cardholder gets their money back easily by making that call to their issuer, they are 10 times more likely to do it again. So it does surprise me that a number of issuers don't actually monitor their card holders in terms of how many disputes they actually raise. That um, sounds horrendous to me. We used to have frequent we used to have frequent flyers in yeah. uh, in fraud and chargebacks. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, Trace. I didn't mean that was, that was the next question I was going to ask around F from a merchant's point of view. When I talk to merchants, one of the deep frustrations is that they're getting a lot of chargebacks 
from the same card holder over a period of time. And the question often asked is, what is the issue we're doing with the card holder about this? Um, they're saying they've never received it. We've got proof to do, we've got photographic evidence or whatever it might be. And they feel that not enough is done by the issuer to stop the chargeback coming through, given this is a, a repeat offender. Is that the sort of thing you, you were just talking about? Yeah, sadly, the, the operators in, in the banks, as I mentioned earlier, they're subject to AHT, average handling times. Okay. So they've got to handle so many calls within a certain amount of time. And it goes back to what Isabel was saying, you need to invest and allow the operator that more time. Because if you give them more time up front, actually you save time, maybe raising a charge back in the first place, having to have a representment, having to go through to arbitration cases. Um, but in terms of merchants, my biggest thing to them is communication with the cardholder. So often the cardholder is expecting a delivery, they've been told in seven days. It gets to day eight, the, the goods aren't there, so they're straight on the phone to the um, issuer, especially where they can't get hold of the merchant. So set the right expectations. Um, otherwise, the cardholder will take the easiest route and almost do a scattergun. They go to the issuer, they go to the merchant, they fire off emails, they do calls all over the place. So communication for me, the merchant to the cardholders is, is really key. Mm -hmm. And then to an issuer, keep track of your cardholders and how many disputes they are raising, because sadly it does happen. No, agreed. And that's, that's a really good point. Just linking to that then, because I'm conscious that when a, a dispute or a chargeback arises, there's often paperwork going backwards and forwards, certainly from the, probably the cardholder to start with, and then perhaps the merchant in an attempt to defend. Again, the, that documentation flow is essential in this dispute management process. And again, is that, do you think that's something that issuers do uh, monitor and prioritize? Or again, do you think sometimes it's something that's, that's left as phase two, phase three and, and, can, be, and can become a little bit of a blockage within a, an issuing business? So sadly, if you go back quite a few years with the scheme rules, you needed everything up front. You know, you really needed to build your whole case. As time's gone by and the schemes have evolved and they've tried to make things a bit easier, they've lessened the upfront documentation that's being required. And you have almost a questionnaire now that you, you complete. Something that I always lived by, even though I didn't need to get all that documentation up front anymore, I still did because I didn't want to have to go back to the cardholder again. So I wanted to make sure that my case was absolutely solid. I've always said chargebacks is a, is a game of tennis where you know, you're hitting the, the, the ball over the fence. Um, my view is you serve an ace. You don't want it coming back from an issuer perspective. But then on the acquiring side, if you have got really good compelling evidence which you should be talking to your merchants about ensuring they retain that type of evidence if necessary, then that means that can go straight back. And the issuer has something really tangible to go back to their cardholder to say, you know, I'm sorry, but you, you, you had a credit, it's temporary. We did advise it was with recourse and now we're going to redebit you. So it's having the right wording and the right evidence. So whilst, yes, you're right, at the moment, the cardholders don't need to provide as much my view is get as much as you can because it helps you so much later on down the line. Yeah, I, need I, agree. Well. I know yeah. we've, we've had lots of conversations about this. Haven't Absolutely. We? No, I completely agree with you there, Tracy. The, the, the stronger the documentation you have up front, the stronger your, your case will be and the less time you're going to, to waste um, going back and forth. And of course, the other side of that is if you get that information right up front, you might realise then that the issuer doesn't have a chargeback right. So you're not setting an expectation that the cardholder is going to get their refund. Um, and then later on, you're having to redebit them. And this goes back again and again, those quality conversations with the cardholder at the first point of contact. Yeah. Yeah. As a cardholder, I would appreciate conversations like that. And it's really important. Can I just move on to sort of established issuers? There are 
whilst I say there are a lot of new issues around, um, you guys are evidence to me that there are quite a few established issues around um, in, in Europe as well as in, in the US. When we, again, when we're talking about dispute management, the, I guess these people, these established issuers that have been in the business for probably 50 years or so, probably think they've got it all nailed down, they don't need to worry. From your experience, what, what guidance would you give established issuers in terms of, um, in terms of their business? Well, I think what's key, we've already mentioned it, um, is, is training. Um, we've, we've discussed many times how uh, people who have quite a lot of experience, 10, 20 years experience, will sometimes abide by old rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still remember giving training to, to some people who, who had 20 years experience and, and were shocked to, to, to be aware that the rules had changed. In fact. And, and a case that they, they thought wouldn't be applicable to them, well, they realized, oh, wow, uh, I can actually charge this back according to today's rules. Yep. Um, so it's very important that they brush off or get rid of their, their old rules and, and all those rules that, that are passed from, from staff to staff, from manager to manager. Sometimes I had people say, oh, well, my manager's been telling me to do this for years now. Well, it's time to teach your manager that the rules have changed. Yeah. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, okay. I think it's it's a living and breathing thing. I mean, we, we said it a couple of times, I suppose, but for established issuers, it's it's really important that you don't let rogue or bad behaviours embed in the organisation. So yeah. there's a few ways to do that. I mean, I know in banks I worked in, we'd have external training. So someone like Isabel or, or, or someone from, from Visa or MasterCard come and just you know classroom learning everyone gets refresher because the rules are changing every year as well there's always you know changes normally twice a year so making yeah. sure that's taught in everyone gets the same training it's not being passed on word of mouth and that your written procedures and processes whether they're customer service facing even customer facing sometimes um are updated and correct and then look at your mi because that will tell you if you've got something going wrong if you're seeing a drift in the in the quality of your chargebacks because of the number of representatives you receive or there's a drift in the number of transactions you're writing off that customers claim, then there's probably something wrong with your operation. So it's about, you know, using the MI to direct you in, in that, it will send you in that direction too, I think are two, two important tools for, for established issuers from yeah. my perspective. Craig, that's great, thank you. Um, let's um, go flip on to the other side. It's not actually, it's not even the other side of the same coin. It's another side of a completely different coin, um, acquirers. <clears throat> um, it's just a really yeah. thick coin. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more than one coin, personally. Um, Not a Bitcoin. Yeah. No. <laughs> You'll never see one of those. Um, a new player in acquiring, or indeed uh, an existing player in acquiring. I know we've talked a lot about issuing, but on, on the acquiring side, is dispute management for them, obviously they don't have the cardholder interaction, but is dispute efficient or dispute handling for them important? Is it, again, is it something they should be prioritizing in their, in their operation? I'd welcome your views on that. Um, well, uh, yeah, I think that it's just as important for, for acquirers to, to make sure that they have proper dispute resolution uh, processes in, in place. I think upstream, what's uh, very important is that acquirers make sure that their merchants uh, follow best practices in the hotel industry, the car rental industry, there are lots of disputes uh, that are, are related to those types of transactions. And if merchants follow best practices, well, they can avoid chargebacks. The best chargeback is no chargeback, as I've True. already said many times. So if they can make sure that transactions are processed correctly and uh, the merchant, as Tracy said as well, that uh, communication is key between the merchant and the cardholder. If the merchant has proper customer service, they provide uh, their details, customer uh, merchant contact details so that the cardholder can contact them. Well, a lot of the chargebacks can be avoided. But it's also important that when the, the chargeback does come in, that the, the acquirer knows how to handle that chargeback. They have to know what the conditions are of that chargeback to be able to verify, is it a valid chargeback? And what do I have to do? What do I have to supply in order to respond to that chargeback? So chargebacks are costly for everyone and proper processing of chargebacks on the, the issuer side, the acquirer side, the merchant side is going to save money to, for everyone. 
I, I completely agree with that. I, I think that um, you know merchants expect service from acquirers when it comes to chargebacks more now than they ever have done. So they're looking for support, assistance. How do I rebut this? And also tell me quickly and you know help me avoid the liability. All, all, all of those things. So you need to have all the things we talked about with issuing. So training, processes, data to be able to handle the ingestion, make sure you've got the, the process correct. But on the other side of it, if you don't have any good processes for dealing with chargebacks, any acquirer would be missing, missing a really, really valuable um, kind of indicator of, of unhealthy business. Because if a merchant is receiving chargebacks, it's probably indicative of something going wrong with that merchant. Whether it's a, you know, a customer service failure because they're not sending the right goods or something, that's easily remedied. But it could also be a remedy of there is something financially wrong with the merchant or there is something that's putting risk on the acquirer who's ultimately responsible for all of the risk. So, so it's, um, chargebacks are like the canary in the mine, maybe, uh, <laughs> that analogy translates uh, outside of the UK, maybe it doesn't. Um, but, but they're a warning sign of maybe something wrong with the merchant and should be used as a, as a, as a, as a tool um, accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly the same, Craig there's bad cardholder behavior and there's bad merchant yeah. Behavior, yeah. Um, which often clouds the actual good behavior that's going out there when there is real genuine dispute that needs to be resolved so. yeah no that's exactly that's right. good point so i mean what, what you've all said collectively really is for an issue they need to be training their cardholders and educating their cardholders and indeed acquirers need to be educating and training their merchants in the same way and, and we have uh, and I've, I've seen varying degrees of that over the years, and I'm sure you have too. Um, just to bring that to life a little bit, as we're coming to the end of the, of the uh, podcast uh, uh, now, it'd be good to hear any stories that you might have in, of your years in payments, perhaps some of the good situations, perhaps some of the bad situations that either you've heard on the issuing side or the acquiring side, because we can learn from all of these. Um, who would like to start on this one? Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna push it to Tracy because I know she's got a I know there's a great story about questioning cardholders carefully about what they are. <laughs> uh, I, I could probably do a whole two hour podcast on, on my favorite stories, but um just to bring some of it to light. So I suppose one of my my favorite ones is a cardholder purchased a parrot um on his um credit card, brought it home fell ill and unfortunately it infected the whole family of eight the whole family ended up in isolation in hospital for six weeks once they came out they came to the the, the issuer demanding their money back for this, this 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 parrot so we had this dead parrot which we ended up having to have an autopsy done to see whether the para actually was ill before they purchased it or after they purchased it, as to whether it was 40 goods um, as such. Um, and I think one of my other stories, not sure whether I'll get away with this one, but I'm going to say it anyway. Well, I'm a, not gen going to a gentleman went to Amsterdam and he paid for fa five ladies of the night to have a champagne bath with strawberries. Sadly, he We've had all done it, Tracy. Sad, I haven't. Sadly, he had an allergic reaction to the strawberries and ended up in hospital. So he didn't get the service that he paid for. So he came to the bank demanding his, his money back. You know, he, he wanted a charge back. Service is not provided. Um, but thanks to the really good questioning of the operator up front, the fact that he was unable um, to perform where he should have done, whereas the ladies were still available and willing obviously his chargeback was declined <laughs> and i've got loads it's the final edit i'll, I'll be stuck <laughs> yeah i think those are our favorite stories all those nightclub scenarios and and the different pictures that we've been supplied with uh, whether it be at the chargeback stage or or in arbitration uh, so yes I, I those are the ones that we remember the most <laughs> yeah i've seen loads of um i've seen loads of um people who've sent in evidence and it's like a, a picture a screenshot of a website of here's who here's who I was supposed to see and then that wasn't the same person who came went to a hotel room or or whatever the arrangement was and 
you've got to try and treat these customers seriously because they spent hundreds, if not more, pounds, euros, dollars on these things. It's it's that's, challenging. That's, it's a tricky job being an issuer. It's a tricky job. Well, when you were talking earlier about um, automating things, there was there was an, uh, an issue. I remember this. This is I should say this was never a bank I worked for, but I saw the case, and the lady had purchased um, had used her credit card to fund surgery for. Um, some breast enhancements, if I can get into that example on this podcast. And, you know, I think as everyone knows, there's been a lot of bad press and, and those those that have been recalled or, or some of the, you know, there's been some health issues attached to them. But the the card scheme in question required, before the, you could make a charge back, you had to have returned the goods. And so the, the, the moral of the story is the issuer was doing this in a very dumb way and was going, well, I can't help you any further because the process ends at you can't return the goods. And the card holder, the lady was saying, well, it's not possible for me to, to, to return these, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, when you've got a very dumb process, you can't help customers. And I mean, there, there must have been lots of people in that same scenario. But, they, you know, they got around it and, and the industry, you know, rallied to make some rules work to get that to happen. And yeah. people got the right outcome. Probably the moral of the story is that chargebacks always deliver the fair outcome. They should. Um so if you've been sold something defective, whether it's inside you <laughs> or not, then, then then it should work out for you. Well, actually, you just have to tender the return now, don't you? Yeah, you just have to tender the oh, return. Depending so on the scheme. It. Depending yes. on the scheme, yeah. Okay, well, um, that's great. Our time is up, I'm afraid. It's been great to have you and, and listen to your, your stories and advice. Um, so I want to thank our guests, Isabel, Tracy and Craig. And I want to thank um, thank you for listening. And I hope you can join us next time. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Steve. <laughs>